Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you might be in the world. And thank you for joining today's uh, Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer. Uh, we're going to focus today on the role of the product owner and why the product owner is not a requirements manager. Um, I'm joined today. So my name is Eric Neighbor. Uh, we're on marketing and operations here at scrum.org, and I'll be your host. And I'm joined by Wilbur Wilbert Seal. Uh, in the Netherlands, who's uh, going to take your questions. So you can start asking them now. Uh, you can wait a little bit until you get some context, but we're going to get started. So next slide. Just a little bit about. Can't see your next slide, Lindsay. Okay, so a little bit about the, the series. Uh, this is your opportunity to ask questions of professional Scrum experts like Wilbert. Uh, it gives you a platform to uh, work together, to, to collaborate, to get a little bit of online coaching as well. Next slide. So just a brief who is Scrum.org for those of you new to this series. Scrum.org is the home of Scrum. We're run by Ken Schwaber, who is the co-creator and founder of Scrum and Scrum.org. Uh, Ken continues to drive forward the work that he's doing around Scrum, the Scrum Guide, uh, and in really focusing on improving professionalism and bringing products to market with greater agility. Next slide. And Will's joined uh, today by his cat. Uh, so what do we do at Scrum.org? We provide professional training, certification, and, and continued thought leadership and ongoing learning uh, like this webinar today. You can see the different classes and certifications that are available. Next slide. And with that, I will hand it over to Wilbert. All right. Um, thank you, Eric. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not seeing the top of the slide very well on my screen. Is that the same for you, uh, Eric? Yeah, it looks like something got um, the the go to meeting has destroyed a little bit of the top of that slide. Oh uh, well, we'll 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 manage. Um, Let's see. Uh, yes, so I am Robert Saylor from the Netherlands. I've been in the industry since give or take about 2011, 2012. Um, and um, worked at HP for a while where I uh, first encountered Scrum. Uh, they sent me out to a PSM course. Um, with what turned out to be my future employer, so may not have been the best decision at the time. Um, and uh, immediately after getting the exam, uh, I was a scrum master. So uh, off I went uh, to Denmark to do some scrum and uh, promptly found out it wasn't as easy as two days of training would apply. Um, but I, uh, I, I learned from my mistakes. I still make them, but you know, that's life. Uh, but I got a lot better at it, and I eventually became a professional Scrum trainer in 2017. Um, I teach almost every Scrum.org training, uh, just not the SPS and PSD courses, uh, though I might need to add those later on. Um, well, as you can see, I have cats. They will join us in the session, most likely, uh, and I uh, live with my girlfriend. Um, I am bottom of the uh, hierarchy over here at home, so uh, all that uh, pent up frustration is going to come out in this session. Um, and so you're uh, a member yeah. of the development team. <laughs> oh man, if, if only, if only. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we can right. go to the next. Uh, one. More, more support staff, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm eager to see what, uh, what questions you guys come up with. Great. So, uh, Lindsay, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So just some quick guidelines. Your microphones are muted throughout. Uh, but please ask your questions. You'll see on the uh, right-hand side there uh, the how to type a question and how to ask those questions. And they're already starting to come in. This is awesome. So let's take a look here. So uh, let's, let's get started. Um, so my team is asking for more detail. How do I write the perfect user story? Mm. Thank you. It's a, it's a common question. Um, 
and one you see quite often when you when you just get started on Scrum. So there's a, there's there's a few things that we can get into uh, on this topic. Uh, I think I think the, the the biggest one we can start off right away is it it doesn't necessarily have to be a user story. Uh, quite often when you when you start using Scrum, uh, it can be a bit of a shock to a team that's been used to working off very large requirements documents and uh, technical architectures and functional architectures. Um, and just getting to just getting to a sprint level and just getting something done is already quite an ask. Uh, Scrum purposely only talks about PBIs, product backlog items, and these can take whatever shape or form uh, that is most conducive to a team picking one up and building it. Um, now, of course, user stories are a popular format, uh, but they are not the only one. So um, if your team is still struggling in that regard, um, you know, you can, you can you can try staying in old requirements for a while just to get them used to the rhythm. Um, that said, they are they are a good format because they have some built-in ambiguity, um, and that kind of gets to the to the second part of the answer, in that um, they they don't need to be perfect. I don't think they even can be perfect. Um, they've been purposely designed to remain very small and it's more of an invitation to a conversation or a memory of a conversation. Um, so by themselves, they will never get to a point where they contain enough information for a team to just build one up without any form of context or interaction with a customer and, uh, and build it. Um, so then the whole point of it actually is to get that conversation going with a customer um, and maybe recording it in such a way in that user story format uh, to recall what happened. Um, now, of course, you as a product owner can do that. I mean, you're you're very likely, especially at the start, to be the one who talks to customers a lot of the time outside of sprint reviews even. Um, though I would encourage you very early on to start involving your development team in this and get that communication going between your customers, your other stakeholders, and your development team. And, and maybe outsourcing a bit of that story writing or ba product backlog item writing to them. Um, your responsibilities are far more on achieving an optimum in value uh, using whatever way you, you would define that for your product than it is to, uh, to be the channel through which the development team knows what to do. They're, they're perfectly capable of, uh, of doing that themselves. Great. Thanks, Wilbert. So we've got another question, uh, and I think this is a pretty common one. I've, I've seen this many times and heard it many times. Uh, wh what role uh, can or should the Scrum Master play in, in backlog refinement sessions? Uh, they're falling into the trap or the bad habit where the Scrum Master ends up acting as a project manager or product manager uh, in a, really a scribe for a, a product owner who's not well prepared. What can they do to help the product owner understand their role and, and get out of this, uh, this, uh, th th this role of helping the product owner, but really teaching the product owner? Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's very tempting and it's, it's an easy trap to, to fall into. Um, so I, I definitely recognize it. I think um, the main the main thing is like you, you mentioned the word before it's 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 teaching. But if you are teaching by doing is fine to do that once. But if you fall into that trap of continuing to take the lead, then what, what's everyone else learning in that regard? And I think, but you know, this is this is maybe something that you need to reflect on yourself uh, or, or have the Scrum Master reflect on is um, it doesn't have to be perfect. And even more than that, it, it doesn't even have to go right. So if you, if you encourage the team to experiment in this and maybe take a step back as a Scrum Master, um, Sure, it, it may be that you're going to start a, a, a sprint with, with ill-defined items or the product owner might run into issues when he tries to order the backlog, but this is a learning experience and 
fortunately, the the rhythm Scrum encourages you to have allows for that learning to take uh, take place. Um, and it also means that if things do go wrong, um, in the worst case, you're going to lose maybe a sprint. Um, but the experience there is without equal. Great. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that helps. And certainly, Joey, if, if, if you've got further questions along those lines, please feel free to ask. Um, so we've got a, just a little bit different subject, um, and we'll, we'll continue on. Uh, we've got a question about a product's been around for a while. It's live. Um, they worked on it for several years. Uh, does it make sense, as this product ha has now lived on, to stick with Scrum? Or should they move to something else like Kanban? Uh, I'm interested in the question behind the question, but of course, in this uh, in this type of uh, setting, it's uh, it's it's a bit hard to maintain interactivity. Um, so I I think I think we run into a very interesting topic here, as in what is a what is a product um, actually. Um, now the way the way I explain this in my classes is that. Um, the, the product is a solution you're offering to a need of a customer. Um, it's, it's that solution they're buying, not the product itself. Um, and I think in, if you at one point have a successful solution to that need, it becomes very tempting to stay trapped in that and to go into this one track mind where you feel that your success is dependent on that solution you're offering. Um, and then as that exists for a long time, um, the experimental nature of Scrum might appear to become uh, somewhat, somewhat useless in a way because you already know what you're building. You're just building more of it. Um, and, and Kanban has the reputation, though not entirely deserved, um, that it allows for a quicker flow, uh, flow of delivery without the start-stop of Scrum where you regularly inspect what you're doing. But if you take that step back and you explore the customer's need and you're willing to entertain the thought that your product that once was the best solution for that customer um, may not stay that way forever, um, from that mindset, then Scrum makes total sense as a platform to continue explore uh, to continue exploring the best way to address that customer need. Great. Yeah, and I'm, as you, as you think about these, it doesn't always have to be one or the other either. As a matter of fact, we have a class that teaches you how to use Kanban practices with Scrum, mm -hmm. and, and how you can help improve flow. Scrum itself is very simple and a very simple process. Uh, it, it gives you a set of roles, a set of events, and a set of artifacts. And then bringing in other practices to help what the team needs to be successful makes sense. And, and it depends on what you're doing. Are you truly in maintenance mode or are you really delivering additional functionality and additional value features and capabilities in that product? So I think there's a, I think you're right. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that have to be evaluated uh, in, in saying, do we move, do we change, or do we stay the same? Do we just evolve? Um, it, at the end of the day, Scrum is about empiricism, which means we want to be constantly reviewing our process. We do this at least once a sprint uh, in our retrospective and improving our process. And that might mean bringing new things in, bringing new practices in. Um, it does. If, if the process itself stays static or stagnant, um, we've also got problems. That's why Ken and Jeff added um, in the last release of the Scrum Guide uh, uh, an item which has been a little controversial but really important, which is we need one process improvement per sprint. And it gets us a it, 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 talking to Ken about this, it really gets us from thinking of the product backlog is just about product features and, and how do we improve the team and making sure we're always improving how we work. So, yeah. um, and, thank you, Robert. And, and keep in mind with that also that a period of stability, um, especially in IT, we have the privilege of working in a field that goes through 
pretty massive paradigm shifts around every five years or so. Um, like going going to cloud and uh, uh, going to NoSQL solutions and these massive distributed si systems and Internet of Things, um, assuming stability in in light of the history we've gone through as a field is very dangerous. So uh, ne next question, uh, this is um, a lot of these come up quite often as this is good. Uh, how do we convince the organization to understand that the product owner is more than just a business analyst? Ah, that's a good one. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a chicken or the egg situation in this. Um, sometimes I, I also get this one posed as how do you, as a product owner, do your job without uh, the mandate or if your organization isn't ready for it yet. Um, so I kind of think back to, to when I was younger um, and my mom, who is an extremely smart woman, um, has told me on several occasions that the best job is the one you create yourself. Um, and I've noted that to be true throughout my professional career. Um, so how do you convince the organization that the product owner is more than a business analyst or isn't a business analyst at all in that traditional sense is, well, don't act like one. Um, take that ownership, even if you don't have the mandate, but take that ownership and, and profile yourself as the product owner that you want to see in the organization, ask those questions that you expect a product owner to ask. Um, build that dashboard um, using uh, evidence-based management techniques. Uh, have those conversations with customers, and you'll see. And and there are there are examples um, in in a lot of organizations where this has happened. Where if you take that ownership and you take that attitude and you profile yourself um, in the role that you want it will happen. The organization will shape itself around you. Great. So um, another question, how can you successfully be a scrum master for a team or an organization if you're not given the autonomy or, or empowered? So I, I mean, I, I guess I reword this a little bit um, to be, how do you get that empowerment? How do you work with the organization to understand why that scrum master needs to be empowered? No. Um, so the answer there is in a way largely the same as, as my previous answer. Um, in that as, as a scrum master, uh, the, the first thing you do is just adding transparency. So what do you see? What surprises you? and then have the courage to, uh, to, to make that transparent to the rest of the organization. Ask those annoying questions and, 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 and point out those, uh, those bruises in a way. Um, you know, it, 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 starts, it starts with being annoying and then going that, that next step of then also suggesting how to resolve those issues or working with people um, such as your development team uh, to to suggest improvements, and um, sure you may not be able to change the whole company in one go, uh, but there are a lot of things through the informal channel that can already be improved if you if you take that initiative. Um, I I I won't wait necessarily for for that autonomy. Um, the first company I worked at, um, I on paper I had I had zero power, um, but I talked to people and I asked intelligent questions and I came up with intelligent solutions. And sure, it didn't work out all of the time, but you do develop a a respect and a rapport, and from that there is influence. Great. So I, I think this this next question kind of ties to that a bit because it, it 
there's always confusion, uh, especially when it comes to leadership and management and, and a lot of things often come up around this. So how, how do you convince management and leadership that the scrum master isn't just a project manager um, and that the, the scrum, that the development team now owns, and really the scrum team owns um, these responsibilities? Well, it kind of, mm, it depends. I know it's a cheap consultancy <laughs> answer. Uh, <laughs> But it kind of depends on the kind of organization you're dealing with. Um, so it it may be that they're very willing, uh, but just not not very informed yet. And then as a scrum master, you uh, have to take a teaching stance in that regard and, and take them through that journey and explain why things are the way they are. It may be that um, that you engage the team in this very early on and make transparent their ability to uh, resolve their own issues and what your role is in this. Um, I've also had the case where I was at companies that really weren't uh, looking for this. Um, and then it's slightly mean, but you might need to go underwater for a bit. Um, and kind of build up a little bit of a dossier over time as things are improving um, and as a scrum master kind of be that shield to the outside world and then once you have that empirical evidence that shows that yes you um, you do your your role in a different way than than their expectations but here's the evidence to back up why that works yeah i think so, some of the things that i've seen as well wilbert is uh transparency and really raising that level of transparency if, if you want to know where things are here's the product backlog have a look it's open this is this is for anybody to see and give them access to it and really empower management to understand uh, make sure and this is critical make sure they're coming to sprint reviews um, I think what often will happen is they expect just things to be delivered and they're not really seeing the value. So making sure that those folks, especially the ones who are asking these questions, they're interested, hopefully, uh, get them to those sprint reviews, um, get them engaged with the team. Yeah, and get empirical. Um, that's one that's quite underestimated, but if you and your team are getting stuff done, um, that opens up a wealth of information that's very interesting to, to, to management and leadership. Um, because the basic thing you can assume about pretty much 99% of the people you meet is that they come to work with the best of intentions. So if they're doing something that um, feels like it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't encourage Scrum to, uh, to flourish, um, then they're they're not purposely trying to ruin your day in this, but there's something that they feel like they need to manage. Um, and historically they've, they've done very well at that. So, but if you're getting stuff done and you're getting that data about your process. Uh, so, so Daniel Vacanti has written an excellent book about this, which actionable agile metrics, which is one of the core things professional scrum with Kanban is also built around. Um, when you work with your product owner and you, you look up um, you look up what your product is doing in the market. So what do we see in terms of usage? What do we what do we see in terms of quality? What do we see in terms of market share? Um, so really showing that Scrum is successful um, that that will buy you a lot of goodwill, which um, which in turn will um, will turn those people into into allies, which can cause Scrum to flourish. But again, it is it is creating that transparency, but also creating things to inspect and adapt. Great. And I just sent out for everybody the link in the chat. So if you're in in the chat box, you can see a link to uh, the book that Wilbert just uh, mentioned: uh, Actional Agile Metrics for Predictability. So an another question. Uh, what should a product owner do when they're encountering changing priorities of items inside a sprint? How do you handle changes during the sprint? Okay. Uh, well, I think question number one is where do those changes originate from? Um, 
because your development team is is going to be inspecting the feasibility of the sprint at the start of every day. That's that's what the daily scrum is for. It's to answer that question, are we still going to get to our sprint goal? Um, you know, and as as a result of this, they they may need to do certain changes in the sprint backlog, which may cause you to become involved at that point. Or it might be that you have a um, a stakeholder that really wants something, or it can be a regulatory thing. So uh, if your stuff just got hacked, you're going to need to drop whatever it is you're doing uh, and go fix that. So. Um, I think depending on the scenario, there are there are ways to approach it. So um, I think the, the the last one is the easiest one. If your license to operate is in danger and if stuff is on fire, well then you know whatever you're doing in that sprint becomes irrelevant. Cancel it, go fix it. Um, if the team is requesting certain changes, then you're going to need to evaluate um, with them. Maybe involve your stakeholders to see if that impacts the sprint goal in any way, because ultimately um, getting a done increment that fulfills the criteria of that sprint goal is what determines the success of a sprint. Um, the most common one though, and the most uh, and the most challenging one is a stakeholder, um, usually a very powerful one, that really wants something in the sprint. Um, and I think the point there is to really try to understand the other's point of view and speak their language. Um, so like, kind of cliche as it sounds, one of the things that I found very effective in this regard is to just talk about money. Um, why do I say that? Well, um, sprints cost money to run. Um, an average scrum team uh, in America uh, will cost about fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a month, um, and if your sprints are uh, shorter than a month, you can kind of calculate backwards from that. Um, it might be hard to figure out the exact number, but these are these are industry standards, and Europe is not much different. Um, so imagine you're running a two-week sprint, which is about a thirty thousand euro investment or thirty thousand dollar investment, um, and someone really wants this item. Now this is going to this is going to impact productivity of that team. Um, you know, at at the base level, um, do you want to risk that investment to get this item in there? Um, well, probably not, especially if it can wait for I don't know, like a week or two weeks. Um, Scrum has a very regular cadence, and there are ways to do this without the without the risk of breaking into an already running uh, thing. Um, of course, the more data you have on product performance, the more empowered you are to um, to ask those questions. So I had a case at a bank a few years ago where we found out one of the VPs just bought an Apple Watch, um, and this was very new at the time. Um, but uh, but of course we 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 get a request to immediately add Apple Watch functionality to the mobile banking app. Um, now, because we had data, we could just look at well, how much uh, what's what's the percentage of our users that uses an iPhone? Well, it wasn't that many because Android is more popular here. Um, well, what's what what's the uh, Apple Watch doing in the market right now? Well, it's very expensive, and our target audience wasn't the extremely rich crowd. So, um, do we want to work on this feature that is going to reach not even half a percent of our users? Well, probably not. And you know, faced with that data, um, we were a lot stronger in refusing that item. Now, a few years later, it of course became relevant, but. Um, then we have the data to back it up that that was a worthwhile investment. Yeah, I often call that happy years, Wilbert. Um, I've worked for many organizations and certainly a lot of uh, CEOs and, and vice presidents of sales who uh, will come back from one customer meeting and now this is the direction we have to go. They have happy years. They heard, they heard something, they got really excited because they think someone's going to pay them for it. Often they're wrong that they'll even really want it because they didn't dig deep enough. But now we're all of a sudden going to add these features or change this direction. And, and it's so important to be able to, to dig in and, and first, I think, understand what they really want 
And then secondly, is that a priority for others or is it just going to make that one customer happy? Uh, now we of course want to make our customers happy, but is it worth the effort time for that one customer if it doesn't support many others? And, and this is a balance that as a product owner, I've run into constantly throughout my, my career in, in working as, as the mo primarily in software, but it's always digging, asking that next question, asking that question to understand the real why they want that, or, or, or is that really the thing that they want? And, and that becomes really important because otherwise you're running in many directions and you end up not delivering the value you're supposed to do. And, uh, which ties to kind of the next question because it's, it's part tied to this, how do we understand uh, what to build? Um, where does the business analyst fit into the development team? Should they be on the development team? Is the role is there a role of business analysis uh, in in business analyst in Scrum? Um, and how do they fit? And just be, I'll, I'll hand it over to you in a second. There, there's a great webinar that um, Scrum.org CEO Dave West uh, did recently around what, what's my role in Scrum that kind of hits on this quite a bit. But I'd love to hear uh, over your opinion. Yeah. So. Um, I, th I think I'll echo Dave in, in one regard. Um, there's no role of business analyst in Scrum. Um, we only have the three. Um, now, do you want business analysis capabilities within your development team? Um, or does it make sense for you as a product owner to have uh, some measure of skill in business analysis? Um, well, sure, if, if that's a valuable skill to add to the product you're building, um, absolutely. Um, now, the reason that there's no specific role is that ideally we want to involve as many people as possible um, within the development team in, in fulfilling this function. So sure, someone with a history and skill in business analysis can um, can take a uh, can take the initiative at first. Ultimately, the team as a whole is going to have to work together to build valuable things for those users. So you want that shared understanding that comes from working as a group and as a group interacting with those people that you're building it for. Um, the risk is, and we've learned this over time, that um, that if a business analyst or someone who does business analysis within a development team becomes a channel, um, this allows for a lot of noise within that process. Um, essentially, what you're doing is uh, you're creating the whisper game. So the whisper game is something I think a lot of you have played in uh, preschool. Um, where you get 10 people and you whisper something to number one and you just see what kind of nonsense pops out of number 10. Here in the US, we call that telephone. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, that doesn't work with 10 kids, but for some reason, we, we do believe it works if we turn it into an organizational model. Um, Scrum kind of breaks with this, and this is one of the, one of many, but one of the core reasons um, why the development team is one role. Um, you're going to need a broad skill set within that team, which is why the team as a whole is cross-functional, um, to deliver that valuable stuff. But no, there is no specific role of business analyst. And, and remember that the way the Scrum, dot, Scrum Guide it describes these things is um, that there's not necessarily, these aren't titles. The role product owner is doing business analysis. The, the role in the development team is doing business anal analysis and, and, and getting people with certain skills are important across that development team to be able to satisfy and, and, and do the things that we need to, to deliver successfully. Um, so next question gets into scaling a bit. Uh, the, the, this organization ha has recently started actually using the Nexus framework. And um, they're struggling a bit with backlog refinement. Um, mm. Do you have any advice for how, how do we get better at backlog refinement and, and make it more valuable across multiple scrum teams? 
Mm -hmm. um, so I think Cesario, one of our uh, fellow PSTs, recently put a post online um, involving multi-team refinement. Um, so that's a good read for a start. Um, I think in general, one of the one of the underused moments for backlog refinement is the sprint review. Um, so everyone's there. Uh, I mean, assume, assuming you're doing Scrum with uh, with some professionalism. Um, so you're gonna have your teams there. You're gonna have your stakeholders there. Now. As a Scrum Master or as a product owner, there are techniques you can use to facilitate that group to, uh, to work on backlog items together there um, by, by mixing and matching, by using things such as, such as liberating structures. Um, I think the core thing as you're scaling, as a product owner, you really need to start focusing on running that business and thinking about value and a lot of the work on the product backlog in terms of specifying items, in terms of maybe even in terms of ordering, um, you're, you're going to have to take those teams along with you so that they're capable of doing that themselves to a large degree. I just sent, um, I put in the chat, so you'll see it in there, a link to a great white paper on cross-team refinement. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty a good white paper to help kind of define that better and help you understand how do we get multiple teams working together on refinement. Uh, okay. Tying in sort of to that question, uh, Yvonne has a question. Uh, what techniques as a scrum master or as a product owner can you use to, to help ensure that PBIs are small enough for the sprint? especially when working with a new development team? That's a really good question. Um, I think um, there's, I think Ryan Ripley at one point uh, did a talk uh, on this. Um, and one of the core recommendations there and one I, one I support in that is uh, write items with only a single acceptance criteria. Uh, aside from the general definition of done. So really focus on that on that atomic piece of value. Um, and also keep in mind that um, the, the sprint backlog, one of the things a lot of a lot of teams do continuously is try to fill it up as much as possible during every sprint. So they kind of look at, okay, we're, we're five people, we're going to do a week long sprint. So what can the five of us do in the next 30 hours? Um, you know, and as you're, as you're starting out, um, I think the goal here is not to be busy. Um, the goal is to get stuff done. So if you're just starting out with Scrum, um, maybe just have your team build a single item um, and get it to done. And that's, that's already going to be quite the challenge if they're coming from a more traditional environment or they're not used to, um, to working in this, in this cross-functional way and having that extended uh, responsibility over, over that value stream, over that development pipeline. So just build one thing in your sprint. And if that's too big, then your team knows it's going to have to be a bit smaller next time. If you get it done, then they'll have learned what they can do in a sprint. And if there's still time, they can even start looking at a second item to get done, bolstered by the experience they had from the first. Um, but, and, and, and sure, there's techniques there in terms of uh, story slicing. Um, in terms of using a single acceptance criteria, in terms of limiting work in progress. Um, many uh, have, have, have been developed, but it, it all starts with just getting things done. Do that first. And you'll find out as you're doing that, that the team is going to, and this is my experience, the team is actually going to invent a lot of those techniques themselves. So by the time you start introducing these 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 more advanced approaches, um, it it it'll be more of a recognition. Um, oh, that's what it's called. Then 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 total surprise. 
Yeah, I think you, you make a good point. One of the important pieces is you don't have to have the whole sprint or the whole sprint backlog filled when you start the sprint. You need just enough work in the sprint backlog to get going, to start the sprint. The other part is, which I'm, I'm, from the question, I'm questioning a little bit if this is understood, the development team should be involved in refinement. Uh, it's not the product owner's job alone to do the refinement. This is a discussion and, and an understanding in, in making sure that the development team understands what that backlog item is and working together to refine it is super helpful because it helps provide clarity to that backlog item with the development team and helps the development team give feedback to the product owner if they believe this is too big or difficult to implement. I think it's also interesting from 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 a demarcation of accountabilities in the, in this regard as a as a product owner you're responsible for value. Um, are we working on valuable things right now? Um, am I am I utilizing my sprint to uh, increase the uh, the business value we're creating and maybe decrease some of the risks that we're running um, as as a company with this product. The the development team is there to get stuff done. Um, so in terms of who should do more of that refinement, I tend to focus on that should be the development team. The development team has to has to understand that item to the degree that with 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 a reasonable amount of confidence they can say yes we can finish this within the sprint um, as a product owner i just and i say just because this is difficult enough by itself i just need to know how valuable is this thing compared to these other things um, and if i if i also veer into how big is this thing and how complicated is this thing sure i like to be informed but I, I don't have the time to be the one that is informing. Great. So um, here's one that I, I know is certainly near and dear to Ken's heart. Uh, how important is it to have a single sprint goal versus five stories tasks that just must be done? All right. Let me see if Ken's on the channel. Oh, it totally <laughs> isn't important at all. You can do whatever. <laughs> Oh God. Okay. Okay. That was a joke. That was a joke. Um, you need a goal. You need one goal. Um, because it, it, it focuses your team. It aligns your team. It creates the circumstances for teamwork to take place. Um, and as a product owner, it also allows you to talk in terms of value to, to enhance that discussion with your stakeholders. So what are you doing this sprint? Well, we're doing item 17, 34, and 41. Okay, that doesn't tell me anything, but sure, now I'll just measure how many items you do. That's that's not the kind of situation when you find yourself in. Um, what are you doing this sprint? Um, well, we're getting ready for launching in the Chinese market, so we're adding Chinese language support. That's gonna work at the end of the sprint. That's a goal, that's a focus. Um, you know, and that that also allows your team to deal with the complexity of software development. Um, because as much as we'd like, we we really can't get into a situation where we know enough at the start of the sprint to say with complete certainty, this is the stuff you're getting. Um, what we want to get to is a point where with a high degree of certainty, um, you can say, well, this is where we this is where we want to be at the end of the sprint. And to get there, these are the things that we intend to deliver. But these might change if that allows us to better meet this goal. So it allows for for that for that flexibility and for that agility in a way. Great. Yeah, we, we need to stay focused. Um, we need to focus on on a common goal and, and continue to drive toward that. Otherwise, are we really delivering value or are we just delivering a whole bunch of features? Uh, so another great, great question. And this is, uh, this to me, this is very um, project management E, if you will, but uh, having the development team together in the product backlog refinement session, wouldn't that disturb their focus 
on the current sprint that is going on? Uh, cheap answer again. It depends. Um, so the the weird thing is that Scrum encourages you encourages refinement to take place, but it's not an event. Um, and I think the way a lot of organizations kind of handle this is by setting up this time slot where backlog refinement takes place. So we get everyone away from the work. And we may put them in a room, or you know, we may even get some customers over. Um, and um, and and yeah, there's start stop on that, and that I I can agree that that ruins focus in a way. You're getting you're getting people out of what they're doing, and you're getting them to do something else. Um, but you know, there's other ways to do refinement. So I think one I already mentioned, and that is utilizing the sprint review as a refinement session, because the whole point of a sprint review is to use what you've learned in a sprint in a conversation with your stakeholders to update the product backlog. So what do you do when you update a product backlog? You refine it, you refine your understanding. The, the, the other thing, of course, is if your team is is really achieving flow. So they they work on things as a team, they get it done, um, you know, they get you as a product owner involved. They can also get their stakeholders involved, like whoever's mentioned in that item. Listen, we've we've now done this thing. Um, can you try it out for us? Is this what you meant? Is this is this the value you intended? But you know, as that happens, the customer is going to talk back to them, is going to give them feedback. And that feedback can immediately be used to enhance the understanding of what is in what is in the product backlog, or maybe add new things to the product backlog, or maybe disprove some things that are there. So I think by limiting, by, by seeing refinement as this separate thing that needs to take place, that can really be room for focus. But if you integrate it in this way, in the way you do Scrum, then it's a very natural thing that starts taking place um, without losing focus. Yeah, and, and I've had this conversation a lot with Ken because people are often asking, oh, why isn't refinement a official event in Scrum? And the answer is one, not every team needs to do refinement. So if we make it an official event, then that means it has to happen. It doesn't always have to happen. It depends on the team. It depends on the makeup. It depends on how well stories or whatever product backlog items are written. Um, the second is it can happen, as, as Wilbert just said, throughout. There, there's no reason we can't do a little bit of refinement here and there depending on what's happening. It could be a question. So development has, has pulled a new backlog item, and they look at it and say, wait a second here. We need to really... To better understand this, we need to refine it some more. Get with the product owner for a few minutes, refine it, and move on. And maybe that's just altering the text. Maybe that's breaking it into several. Maybe it's combining two into one. It obviously is going to depend on the scenario. But but this is an ongoing thing, and refinement is an ongoing thing. So it doesn't always mean pulling people out and sitting in a meeting. That said, if we can't afford to pull a few folks or the right folks together for say an hour every two weeks or every four weeks to, to look at the backlog and make sure we're making progress in the future, then we're probably missing something here and, and, and struggling with what is our goal to deliver value, making sure we're delivering the right value. So we've got time for maybe one or two more. Um, here's one that there's a bunch of people who have asked a similar question. So. I'll paraphrase based on a bunch of these, but um, have you seen teams or, or organizations where maybe one team is, is using a different method than another? Maybe one's using Scrum, another group's using Waterfall, maybe even another is using um, Kanban, for example. And, and how, how do these teams work together? Do you have any suggestions on how they can best work together? Oh boy. Um... I think the main question is, um, do these teams have to work together? Because um, there, there are organizations that just deliver different products in different ways. 
Um, I think one of the, there's a large accountancy technology firm in the Netherlands um, that for their uh, corporate offering uses a waterfall approach. Um, whereas for their uh, consumer finance option, um, they use Scrum. And because those systems are extremely independent of each other, um, like it's it's all the, whatever uh, whatever interaction they have is is very loosely coupled and service based, um, then yeah, it's it's not going to impact anything at all. Now it starts turning into something really interesting um, once you have a system of interconnected components, um, and this is something that we saw a few years ago. Uh, during the, I'm not sure if it's still a thing, but during the initial rise of the buying model uh, approach. Um, is that still a thing, Eric? No, I don't know. Well, so buy, buy modal is something that I know Gartner Research has done a lot of talking about. I think they've backed off of that a bit, but it's still out there. Yeah. So so the argument there is that for, for systems of record that, that, that move slower, um, or perceived to move slower, you can use a more project-based approach um, from a uh, from a quality perspective. Though, you know, as a as a Scrum professional, I would uh, I would argue that quality in professional Scrum is the same, if not higher, uh, due to the frequent getting doneness of what you're doing. Um, whereas other parts of, uh, of of the system landscape can move quicker now. Um, the issue there is is really what do you find empirically? Um, if some teams are DSDM based and others are waterfall based and others are Kanban based and they all have to integrate at any point, but that all works and it doesn't come at the cost of business agility, which is what you as a product owner are of course looking for, then um, you know find out what a more pressing problem is. Um, that said, you're more likely to find out that it doesn't work because they have issues integrating. Um, and now you're, uh, and, and then it really becomes time to, to talk with those developers. Um, and uh, basically it's their problem, right? I'm, 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 I'm being kind of, kind, of, kind of hard about this, but, um, very often you see that that the organization will turn a technical issue such as dependencies and integrations into an organizational issue where we where we try to manage them. Um, but this is a technical issue. So if you find out that teams using a, a lot of different approaches to their work is hampering your business agility, then you talk to those teams and you encourage them to resolve that. Um, in a way so that it doesn't hinder your ability as a product owner to steer value delivery. Great. Thank you. So uh, I want to be conscious of, of time. So um, Lindsay, if, if you can move on to the next slide, please. Great. So um, thank you, Wilbert. Um, I, I think it's been really helpful. There are just questions we weren't able to get to. Um, we'll try to respond to those directly via email. Um, and continue your learning. Uh, if you head off onto the scrum.org website, you can find learning paths for product owners, for scrum masters, for agile leaders, and, and we're working on others for development team members uh, as well, and there will be others that come up. And, and these are great learning paths. They're set uh, based on a set of competencies and focus areas and then different content to help you really drill down and continue your ongoing learning. Next slide. And with that, I just want to say thank you and uh, feel free to reach out to Weber, reach out to myself or scrum.org and you know, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. And uh, don't forget, we're always posting lots of blogs in this ongoing series. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you.